The Evolution of Mermaids in Pop Culture Humans have been telling tall tales of mythical creatures for thousands of years now, and alongside elves, fairies, dragons, and werewolves, mermaids have made some of the most frequent appearances in modern media, serving as inspiration in literature, film, and even fashion. Throughout history, the half-human, half-fish hybrid has been depicted in a variety of ways, from a beautiful and naive romantic, to a mystical and cunning trickster, to a wicked and violent spirit who lures others to their deaths. In today's video, we're going to be discussing the evolution of the mermaid, including their origins as a Greek myth, the positive and negative connotations that they've developed over the years, their various depictions in Hollywood, and their enduring popularity. In 2023, we'll be seeing several mermaids up on the big screen, including Halle Bailey as Ariel in The Little Mermaid, Dua Lipa in the upcoming Barbie movie, and the animated Ruby Gilman, Teenage Kraken. So it's no surprise that we're seeing this burst of popularity trickle down into clothing trends, with the aptly named Mermaid Core being touted as one of the biggest aesthetics of the summer. Which brings me to today's sponsor, ThreadUp. ThreadUp is an online consignment store that helps make secondhand shopping easy and affordable. As an ode to today's topic, I got a couple of mermaid-inspired outfits from ThreadUp, like this ocean skirt from Love You Dear for $20.99 off of its original price of $48. I paid $29.99 for this blue planet skirt, which was originally $59.90. I paid $16.99 for this Betty Blue halter top, which was originally $64. These naturalizer heels were $42.99 off of $127. And this matching St. John's purse was only $25.99 off of $76. I also got this skirt from Scoop for $14.99, which I paired with this cropped blouse from Topshop for $19.99. As you can see, ThreadUp has tons of options to choose from, and by making the choice to shop secondhand, you're not only helping your wallet, but the planet too. I don't know about you, but if there are any mermaids out there, I want to do my part to make sure that they have somewhere they can keep swimming. If you're looking for some hidden gems for yourself, go to ThreadUp today and use my code MODERNGIRLS for an extra 40% off your first order or click the link in the description. Now let's get into the video. Tales of mermaids, pun intended, have existed all over the world for thousands of years, with the mythical creatures having unique behaviors and appearances depending on the culture in question. The Western concept of mermaids are believed to have stemmed from the sirens of Greek mythology, which were originally human-bird hybrids that lured men to their deaths with their hypnotic voices. One of the most well-known stories about sirens in Greek literature comes from Homer's 8th century BC epic poem, The Odyssey, in which Odysseus orders his crew to tie him to the mast of their ship so he can listen to the siren's irresistible song without dying. Although bird-like depictions of sirens were found in Greek art through the Byzantine period, during the Hellenistic period, which began in 323 BC, the creatures were occasionally pictured with the tails of fish. Atagardus was a Syrian fertility and water goddess who had been depicted as half fish as early as 1000 BC, and was later worshipped all over the Mediterranean where she was known as Derketo by the Greeks, and she was even cited as an influence behind the rise of aquatic sirens in ancient Greek artwork. In one of her myths, the then-humanoid Atagardus falls in love with a mortal man, but out of shame flings herself into a lake and transforms into a fish. But the water is unable to hide her divine beauty and she retains her human form from the waist up. Atagardus's beauty and her bittersweet story, combined with the seductive voices and tempestuous natures of traditional sirens, has been interpreted as the blueprint for the mythical mermaids that would become popular across Europe during the Middle Ages. And this lingering influence can be seen through many Romance languages using cognate terms for siren to refer to what we now know as mermaids. The term mermaid was in use as early as the 13th century, and came from Old English, and is a straightforward combination of mare, meaning sea, and maid, meaning young woman. Although female merfolk were more often depicted, there were also tales of mermen, something no doubt inspired by the existence of Triton, the Greek god of the sea. Mermaids grew popular in medieval Europe thanks to bestiaries, an illustrated book of beasts which detailed various animals' religious significance. Often pictured holding a comb or mirror, sirens slash mermaids were interpreted as having the most sinful qualities of a woman, being vain, lustful, promiscuous, and rebellious. Although often used by medieval Christians, much of the information in bestiaries came from ancient Greek myths and philosophers, hence the inclusion of imaginary creatures like unicorns and dragons, which along with mermaids are now considered staples of the medieval fantasy genre. 
In British folklore, mermaids took direct inspiration from Greek sirens, often being seafaring seductresses with bewitching singing voices, and they were depicted as unlucky omens who both foretold disaster and caused it. In Scottish and Irish folklore, their most popular version of the mermaid was the selkie, who instead of being fish-inspired was more seal-like, and had the ability to shapeshift. Although there were many tales about the selkie, in most cases, a human man would steal the beautiful woman's seal coat, and now that she was unable to return to the sea, she would have no choice but to become his wife. No matter how many years had passed and how content she seemed to be with her newfound domesticity, the selkie would gaze longingly at the ocean, and upon finding her hidden coat, she would immediately return to her true home and abandon those on land. Unlike mermaids or sirens, selkies had a dual nature. On one hand, they were friendly and helpful, being a sign of good luck, but they could also be dangerous and vengeful, lulling humans into a false sense of security. The Japanese equivalent of a mermaid was the ningyo. First appearing in art and literature in the 7th century, they were believed to be a bad omen. Unlike European mermaids who were given personalities and even morality on occasion, the ningyo was nothing more than a human-faced fish, and one of the most famous Japanese folk stories involving the creature implied that eating its flesh would grant you immortality. Many believe that the reason classic mermaids continued to have a negative reputation regardless of the culture depicting them is because of their association with the ocean and perilous events such as floods, storms, shipwrecks, and drownings. With sailors of the time setting out on grand voyages in search of riches and new lands, many never to return home again, these fears of the open water manifested themselves in the forms of mythical creatures like krakens and mermaids, who became symbols of the various dangers at sea. In order to metaphorically tame the sea, it became more common to hear talk of people attempting to capture mermaids, leading to the rise of fables which spoke of mermaids that granted their captors a single wish in return for their freedom. With mermaids making appearances in myths around the world for hundreds of years, there were a good amount of people who truly believed in their existence, and hearing tell of a mermaid sighting or capture was incredibly common. Christopher Columbus famously reported that he had spotted mermaids while sailing around the Caribbean in the 15th century, saying they weren't as beautiful as he'd been led to believe, which is likely because the sea creatures that he and so many other sailors had seen weren't in fact mermaids, but other large marine animals like manatees, whales, or seals. During the Age of Enlightenment, an intellectual and philosophical movement in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries, mermaids remained a topic of conversation, with scientists and philosophers attempting to gather evidence that either proved or disproved the existence of the elusive creature. This study of and fascination with mermaids only served to further their popularity going into the 19th century, which encouraged people to include them in art, novels, and even museums. Although people had been faking mermaids since at least the 16th century, the 19th century is when these attempts became more brazen, with people actually creating mermaids of their own in the hopes of fooling and fascinating the public. The more obvious attempts included people dressing up and pretending to be sunbathing mermaids, which were quickly debunked. Some people created crude taxidermied versions of the creatures, but instead of being half-human, the torso would often be made of monkeys or even dogs. Motivated by fame and fortune, these shriveled up monstrosities could be seen all over the world, not only in museums and sideshows, but coffee houses and taverns as well. You would think that this would have shattered the illusion, but instead people were drawn to the fictitious idea of mermaids even further, and they became one of the most popular motifs of the Romanticism movement, where they became symbols of temptation and femininity. It was around this time that one of the most famous mermaids was created. Written by Hans Christian Andersen in 1836, The Little Sea Maid, also known as The Little Mermaid, has since become one of the best-known literary works to feature the finned creature. Unlike other works that painted mermaids as villainous, or at the very least, devious, Andersen's Little Mermaid was kind-hearted, virtuous, and selfless. In a reversal of the stereotypical mermaid story, she didn't seduce a man with the intention of drowning him at sea, but traded in her tail for a pair of legs and chose to die instead of killing the one that she loved. Mermaids made their celluloid debut in the 1904 silent film La Sirene, where the character was part of a magic trick, appearing as a beautiful young woman, styled and posed in a way that was reminiscent of other mermaid-centric art from the time period. Unlike witches, which we covered in a different video, mermaids weren't as popular a character trope in early cinema, perhaps because their signature tale was deemed too costly or difficult in effect for the average film. And it wasn't until the 1910s that we began seeing mermaids more frequently, or more accurately, one specific mermaid. 
Australian swimmer Annette Kellerman was one of the first famous women to begin wearing a one-piece bathing costume instead of the then-accepted pantaloons, popularizing the style as well as the sport of synchronized swimming. She appeared in several films over the course of the 1910s and 20s, with most having an aquatic element where she would perform some sort of water stunt. Kellerman first appeared as a mermaid in 1911's Siren of the Sea, becoming the first actress to wear a swimmable mermaid costume on film, effectively paving the way for future on-screen sirens. She continued her mermaid appearances in Neptune's Daughter in 1914, A Daughter of the Gods in 1916, Queen of the Sea in 1918, and Venus of the South Seas in 1924. No doubt inspired by The Little Mermaid, in many of these films Kellerman's character falls in love with a human and is granted a human body, and overall these mermaids were less villainous than their cultural inspirations. A Daughter of the Gods is considered to have the first completely nude scene by a major star, although most of Kellerman's body was covered by her long hair. But it is interesting to note how this tied into the age-old perception of mermaids being provocative. In the latter part of the 1920s, animated shorts grew popular, with characters like Mickey Mouse, Betty Boop, Popeye the Sailor, and Felix the Cat becoming major stars. Because animation allowed its characters to accomplish physical feats that a real human couldn't, mermaids made significantly more appearances through the 30s and 40s than they had during the silent film era. On one end of the spectrum were cherubic merfolk, who were sweet yet simultaneously silly, endearing them to the public where they proceeded to make appearances in art and home decor. Although many people associate animation with children's films, back in those days that wasn't always the case, with many shorts being created with adult audiences in mind, specifically men. Because animation wasn't as heavily censored as the rest of the film industry, grown mermaids were hypersexualized, flaunting their bare chests and blatantly flirting with the male lead. The only instance where she wasn't depicted as a seductress is 1932's King Neptune, when she's instead captured by a group of lecherous pirates who proceed to manhandle her in a rather unsettling way, before she's rescued by the other sea creatures, resulting in a darker, slightly more traditional depiction of mermaids than we'd seen thus far. In 1948, two separate romantic comedies that featured mermaids were released, Miranda and Mr. Peabody and the Mermaid, with the former being more popular in the UK and the latter in the US. Both films had incredibly similar premises, with a man in a tedious marriage going on holiday and while fishing, catches himself a mermaid. Both mermaids were mischievous and alluring, although they had vastly different roles in the story. In Mr. Peabody and the Mermaid, the mermaid Lenore is a mute and is kept hidden, with Mr. Peabody taking it upon himself to teach the childish mermaid about romance. Meanwhile, Miranda has significantly more agency and control, capturing the human until he promises to show her the human world, where she proceeds to seduce several men, much to the chagrin of the human women. She would proceed to make a reappearance in the 1954 sequel, Mad About Men, where Miranda trades places with an identical human and once again wreaks havoc on land in the form of rampant flirtation. In both films, the mermaid is effectively the other woman, serving as a young and beautiful foil to the male lead's demanding and boring wife. This was a rather popular trope in the 40s and 50s, as seen in The Seven Year Itch, and was a juxtaposition to the idyllic family values that seemingly defined the era. In these scenarios, the middle-aged men going through menopause would meet a charming young girl who reminded them of their own youth, and they would commit varying levels of adultery before coming to their senses and returning to their wives. Although Lenore is made out to be more innocent than Miranda, both mermaids' temptatious characterization can be seen as a callback to the sirens of old, while also mirroring how women in the real world were often blamed for a man's indiscretions. Mermaids made a brief appearance in Disney's 1953 animated film, Peter Pan, where they embodied many of the negative traits that had been given to the creature over the years. Right off the bat, they're depicted as beautiful but also vain, similar to their medieval counterparts. They're perhaps the most vindictive mermaids we've seen in film thus far, although their animosity is directed towards Wendy instead of Peter, something owed to the fact that they see her as an unwanted competitor in the battle for his affections. By this point, it was clear that there was a recurring theme when it came to Hollywood's depiction of mermaids, with the creatures exhibiting negative traits that are most associated with women like jealousy, vanity, and flirtatiousness. In the 60s and 70s, there were a few one-off mermaids, whose sexuality was no longer suggested, but in fact one of their driving motivations. If it weren't for the fact that they were clearly made to appeal to the male gaze, you could almost interpret their sexual liberation as a reflection of feminist movements of the time, which were pushing for women to have more control over their bodies. 
1972 anthology series, Night Gallery, seemed to address the widespread objectification of mermaids, and therefore, women. In the episode Lindemann's Catch, a sea captain's sexual desires awaken after capturing a mermaid, but because she has a tail from the waist down, he's unable to take their relationship to the next level. To remedy the situation, he seeks out a potion that will make her complete, and although it gives her human legs, she gains a fish torso. Demonstrating the shallowness of man and their carnal desires, the captain is still attracted to the mermaid, grasping desperately after her while she attempts to jump ship. In the 1980s, we saw women enter the workforce en masse, gaining newfound levels of independence, which trickled into depictions of female characters in mainstream media. It was a decade of firsts, with the first woman to serve as a Supreme Court judge, the first woman to run for vice presidency, and the first mermaid to actually be given a proper personality that wasn't rooted in age-old stereotypes. 1984's Splash is considered a major turning point for the mermaid archetype, with the film being credited for a trope that is now referred to as the Splash Method. The Splash Method refers to a mermaid who has the ability to become human when they're dry, but temporarily reverts back into a mermaid when they get wet. In some cases, they're able to do this forever, but in Splash, Madison has only a week to fool around on land, or else she may never return to the sea again. Mermaids have been taking on human appearances for centuries, as seen with selkies, but Splash's take on the trope gave mermaids more agency as they were now able to make the decision to leave the ocean themselves. You could interpret the desire that 80s mermaids had to leave the sea for land as an analogy for women leaving their homes for work, while a mermaid's ability to switch back and forth mirrored how women were doing it all. Splash was an incredibly popular film, not only leading to the rise of Madison as a girl's name, but also leading to the mainstream popularity of mermaiding, the practice of wearing a tail and role-playing as a mermaid. Mermaiding can be both a hobby and a profession, and in the 21st century, you can even hire professional mermaids for parties. Five years after the release of Splash came Disney's The Little Mermaid, which is without a doubt the most recognized film about mermaids of all time. Although it takes inspiration from Hans Christian Andersen's story of the same name from the previous century, The Little Mermaid has a much happier ending. Up until that point, the vast majority of mermaid content had been aimed at adults, hence their sexualization. But Ariel was intended to be a role model, and as a result, she was given more positive attributes, although she is by no means perfect. As is often the case, she still falls in love with a human, but instead of scheming and seducing him as many other mermaids had done, the two fall in love of their own accord, even when others attempt to keep them apart. By taking this more family-oriented approach to mermaids, Disney was not only able to strike gold critically and commercially, but also set a precedent for how mermaids would be perceived to this day. Mermaids were a certifiable hit with younger demographics, as evidenced by the sudden rise of mermaid dolls in the late 80s, and they began to make their way into media aimed at children specifically, with Disney even releasing a Little Mermaid prequel series. Mermaids made a brief appearance in 1991's Hook, a reimagining of the story of Peter Pan, and with their neon hair and sparkly skin, they look like literal Barbie dolls, although I think they were actually intended to be eye candy for the dads who were dragged to watch the movie. In the mid to late 90s, we saw more tween and teenage mermaids, and although they weren't blatantly objectified, because that'd be weird, they often served as love interests, as seen in 1995's Magic Island. In Sabrina Down Under and the 13th Year, both released in 1999, we saw the return of the merman, with their transformation into a human or mermaid serving as a metaphor for puberty and general teen angst. The 13th year was notable for flipping numerous tropes about mermaids on its head, not only by having a male character as its merfolk protagonist, but by having him end the film by returning to the sea. Similar to Splash, the film depicts humans as the villains, with their respective merfolk being hunted by scientists who intend to dissect them regardless of their sentience. Considering people were literally sewing animal parts together to make fake mermaids back in the 1800s, I appreciate this rather realistic viewpoint of how humans would deal with the existence of mythical creatures. While mermaids had made appearances in Hollywood for several decades, it wasn't until the 90s that there was a notable rise in mermaid media in other countries, especially Japan, where they made frequent appearances in animated shows and movies. As we mentioned, Japanese folklore had its own version of the mermaid, the ningyo, but interestingly, the vast majority of mermaids featured in Japanese content took inspiration from the West, with their appearance being more human than fish. 
This is likely because of the popularity of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tale in the country, with Japan even producing an animated film based on the story back in 1975, 14 years before Disney's version. Even in the series Mermaid Saga, which followed the Japanese legend of a mermaid's flesh granting immortality, the creatures are more reminiscent of their western counterparts in appearance, although they're much more wicked in nature than other projects released around the same time. Because of the rising popularity of the magical girl around the world in the 2000s, mermaids who could transform and had magical powers became popular in Japan as well, with Mermaid Melody airing in 2003, and throughout the 2000s we would see mermaids with special abilities. By the 21st century, tweens and teens had become one of the most profitable demographics in the entertainment industry, and because of their popularity with kids the prior decade, various movies and TV shows featuring mermaids were pushed into production. When placed in a fantasy setting, mermaids tended to take notes from myths, being more bloodthirsty, devious, and alluring. In 2003's Peter Pan, the audience is warned that mermaids aren't as kind as we've been led to believe, and they're depicted more like monsters who use their human-like appearance as a way of hunting. In 2003's Sinbad, we see not mermaids, but sirens, who now have a water-like appearance and use their voices to lure men to their deaths. Only men. I find this distinction to be rather interesting because it ties into how mermaids were primarily objectified and villainized by men. In 2005's Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, merpeople still retain their beautiful voices, but have a far more fishy appearance. No longer objects of desire, this is probably the closest to what actual mermaids would look like, and it's interesting to note that even within the film, the romanticization of the myth is acknowledged. Although mermaids had become as much of a staple in children's make-believe as princesses, there were of course some mermaids that were aimed at adults, having hypersexualized appearances and mature storylines. In the 2003 TV film Mermaids, a trio of sisters seek vengeance for their father's murder, leading them to live on land in order to hunt down the fishermen responsible. In typical fashion, some of the sisters fall in love with humans. Mermaids also made appearances in the popular series Charmed, with a mermaid trading her immortality for a pair of legs in order to find love, while Phoebe Hallowell, one of the series' main characters, is accidentally transformed into a mermaid herself. The episode was immensely successful, leading to a spin-off series, Mermaid, entering production. Although a pilot was filmed in 2006, it wound up not getting picked up, which is rather ironic considering all of the other mermaid-focused content released that year. This began with Aquamarine, which followed a mermaid who runs away from home in the hopes of falling in love. Although initially set up as a story about romance, it becomes a thoughtful examination of the importance of female friendship, which was mirrored in other media at the time, like H2O Just Add Water, another 2006 project that featured mermaids. The show followed three teenage girls, Ricky, Emma, and Cleo, who after being stranded on a mysterious island, discover that they can turn into mermaids if they touch water, and that they have different magical powers. Similar to Aquamarine, the series focused on the more relatable aspects of being a teenager, like school bullies, bad grades, or unrequited crushes, but these situations were made even more stressful because of their mermaid status. The mermaids in Aquamarine and H2O were significantly less fantastical than prior iterations, instead coming across like normal teenagers, just with tails. By giving them interests like shopping and boys, and having them exist in the real world, they were immediately relatable to their young audience. Female-centric trios were an incredibly popular trope in film and TV at the time, as seen with the Powerpuff Girls, Totally Spies, and Charmed, which were all indicative of the rise in girl power media, which sought to make women appear strong and powerful, even though they had hobbies and interests that were previously ridiculed for being too feminine. Because of The Little Mermaid's enduring popularity, the creatures were heavily associated with femininity and princess culture, and considering they had made mermaid-themed dolls for decades at that point, Mattel deciding to make their own mermaid movie was a no-brainer. Barbie Mermaidia was similarly released in 2006, and took an in-depth look at the world of merfolk that had been briefly touched upon in previous installments of the Fairytopia series. Because the film's intended audience was significantly younger than Aquamarines or H2Os, their mermaids were less relatable and more heroic, and they were used to teach some type of important moral lesson. Even after the Barbie franchise moved away from classic fairy tales to focus on more contemporary stories, mermaids continued to make appearances in the Barbie cinematic universe, as seen with Barbie in a Mermaid Tale in 2010. Taking place sometime during the 18th century, the mermaids in 2011's On Stranger Tides are depicted in a rather stereotypical and shallow manner. As beautiful as they are vicious, these mermaids attack a group of soldiers who intend to capture them for a magic ritual, and despite their actions being justified, they're made out to be the villains. 
One mermaid is eventually captured and gains a pair of legs, and proceeds to develop a romance with a missionary who effectively becomes her savior. Nothing more than a pretty face who gives her lover a purpose, she feels like a step backwards when it comes to mermaids, having significantly less motivations than her contemporary counterparts. Although mermaids have been depicted in a negative manner for ages, it wasn't until the 21st century that they became major players in the horror genre, beginning with 2001 She Creature and Dagon, and in 2010s it was a full-blown trend, at least in the indie scene. In some cases, like 2011's The Cabin in the Woods, they were nothing more than terrifying monsters, but in others, like 2015's The Lure or 2017's Blew My Mind, the myth of the mermaid served as a coming-of-age metaphor. Some others, like 2019's Mermaid Down, had mermaids that could be interpreted as symbols of female rage, seeking revenge against humans, often men, who had wronged them in some way. You might have noticed that despite appearing in Hollywood for over a century, the vast majority of merfolk have been white. Diversity has been an issue in the American film industry since its inception, and it's only in more recent years that we've seen improvements in that regard, something that's only possible because people have finally been drawing attention to the matter and criticizing what has long been the norm. While you might wonder why it matters that a fictional character is depicted as non-white, it's important to understand that mermaids have long been seen as the pinnacle of desirability and attractiveness. So what does it say about society's beauty standards that more often than not, they're white? Even though Disney's 2023 live-action remake of The Little Mermaid has its fair share of issues, I have to commend it for being one of the first major projects to include people of color as mermaids, even if certain characters, like Ariel's sisters, barely appeared in the final product. Besides film and literature, mermaids have permeated numerous other aspects of pop culture. In the music industry, it isn't uncommon to see imagery commonly associated with mermaids appear in lyrics or music videos, with one of the earliest examples being the 1992 music video for No Ordinary Love. In more recent years, Little Mix, Doja Cat, Harry Styles, and Maroon 5 have paid homage to mermaids in their music videos. Some artists have utilized a dreamy, retro aesthetic in a throwback to the 1940s and 50s, with kitschy aquatic motifs like shells, starfish, pearls, and crowns. Others have gone for a more realistic approach, creating a juxtaposition between the mermaid and its surroundings for the purposes of humor or symbolism. The fashion industry has similarly taken notes from mermaids, with brands like Blue Marine and Versace releasing collections inspired by the ocean and the mythical creatures swimming around in it. As always, this trickled down to the masses, prompting the rise of the aesthetic known as mermaid core. Like other trendy aesthetics of the modern era, like cottage core or whimsy goth, mermaid core includes a variety of key elements that create an overarching theme. In this case, a mermaid, but on land. The popularity of the aesthetic proves that our fascination with mermaids isn't going anywhere. I just hope that we'll begin to see even more of them up on the big screen. I personally wouldn't be opposed to a live-action fantasy film that was more faithful to the original Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale, even if it means it doesn't have a happy ending. Thanks again to ThreadUp for sponsoring this video, and if you're looking for a way to support the channel, go ahead and click the link in my description. What type of mermaid movies would you like to see in the future? I hope you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon!